Uh, thanks, Jan. Uh, so I'm Akar Gupta. I'm currently a postdoc researcher at Waterloo, uh, and this work is in collaboration with Jushin Yang and Ravan Valakrishnan from University of Toronto. So in this work, I'll propose a novel technique for passive tagging called motion codes. Now, passive tags are machine-readable, zero-power tags that are placed on physical objects or surfaces. So for example, RFID tags or magnetic strips or optical tags like barcodes and QR codes. Right? These are all passive tags. Now, things like RFID tags, they have significant installation overheads. Uh, Whereas optical codes, uh, we can print them uh, on a standard printer and scan, scan them using a camera. The problem is that capturing with a camera may not be useful or viable in certain situations. Uh, for example, in situations where cameras are not allowed or prohibited, um, optical codes are also difficult or infeasible to use for visually impaired users. And therefore, we explored an alternative uh, passive tacking mechanism which we call motion code. And motion codes have tags that are scanned using finger motion on the tag. So these tags can again be printed on a standard printer. So for example, here uh, there's this flyer on a notice board um, and it has a motion code that encodes the relevant hyperlink. And the user who's interested in that can scan that motion code by simply moving the finger over it uh, and this motion is captured by a ring on the finger that then decodes it into the hyperlink. Right, so no uh, taking out the phone, fiddling with the uh, focus, um, directly walk up and scan the uh, motion code. So the tags for motion codes are simply patterns that consist of a series of lines that the user can trace with their finger. And the ring that we use is a simple nine-axis inertial motion unit that captures the acceleration and orientation of the finger. Also, notice the button on the side. Uh, that is used by the user to indicate the beginning and end of scanning. And because we only use this simple motion sensor, the scanning for motion codes is uh, low power, low cost, and uh, lightweight, even more lightweight than uh, scanning using a camera. And therefore, this is something that can be easily incorporated into miniature rings or watches uh, or other wearables. Um, now, motion codes also support optical scanning because all the information is present visually. So the user can choose whether to perform motion scanning of the motion code or to perform optical scanning of the motion code. So let's get into the design of motion codes. Uh, we designed two different schemes which we call asterisk and obelisk. Uh, we'll start with asterisk. So this is an asterisk tag, and the numbers uh, that you see on the edges indicate the order of the steps in which the user has to move over these lines. Right, so the user starts at the center and then performs strokes back and forth along the lines. So let me just play this again. Uh, so notice how the user is pausing momentarily between every stroke, right? So this is something that helps the detection uh, work accurately. So these are uh, some asterisk tags that are different from each other. And as you can see, all of them have the same layout, which is this asterisk uh, shaped layout, but they differ in the order in which the user has to trace these lines. Um, so you can see the numbering that is around these tags differ. Also, uh, notice that all these tags have a zero at the bottom, uh, at the downward uh, line at the bottom. So in asterisk, all tags always start with the downward line. So the first thing that the user does is goes to this red center and then takes their finger down and then back up. Um, so all tags always start with this line zero. So now the question is, how does information encoding actually work in asterisk? Uh, now the information capacity of any scheme is the total number of different patterns that are supported by it. Uh, and so we want to maximize the information capacity of asterisk while ensuring that the scanning is sufficiently accurate. 
So we first define a quantity called base angle, which determines how many possible lines we will have in the encoding. So here the base angle is 45 degrees, uh, which means that the encoding has eight possible lines at zero degrees, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, uh, and so on until 315 degrees, right? And you can see these eight lines here. And because line zero is always fixed at the bottom, we measure the angles relative to line zero. So with a base angle of 45 degrees, we have eight possible relative angles uh, with respect to line zero, right? So after line zero, line one can be any of these eight possible lines. Uh, for instance, uh, for this tag, we see that line one is at 90 degrees relative to line zero. Similarly, line two can be any of these eight possibilities. Uh, similarly, line three, line four, and so on. Uh, now, we can have any number of steps here, which means that the number of lines that the user has to trace can be anything, but we fix the number of steps to eight, uh, as you can see in the number labels. Um, and we do that because we, want, we do not want the scanning to go forever, uh, and we want to limit the time that the user scans a particular code. Now, because at every step we have eight possibilities, and there are eight steps, uh, the total number of possible patterns that are enabled by uh, this asterisk encoding is eight to the power eight, which amounts to 16.8 million possible patterns. And that's an information capacity of 24 bits. Now, if we increase the number of steps from eight, then we can get even more information encoded. But again, uh, that will take more time to scan. The other way we can increase information capacity is by reducing the base angle. So for example, if the base angle is 30 degrees, uh, then we'll have 12 possible relative angles, which is 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and so on and so forth. Um, and which would result in almost half a million possibilities with eight steps. But at the same time, a lower ba base angle has a lower margin of error uh, because the motion detection for decoding the correct information would have to be more precise for smaller base angles. So uh, again, that's something that we uh, evaluate later. So now let's look at how the motion data is decoded. Uh, we've already talked about encoding the data. So when a user scans a random asterisk tag, the decoding should output the eight relative angles one to eight. So for example, for this particular uh, asterisk tag that you see, um, these are the angles that the decoding should output. So the relative angle for line one with respect to line zero is 90 degrees. For line two, it is 315 degrees. Right. And to get these angles, we compute the direction vectors for all the strokes that the user performs. Right, so for each line, we have two strokes because the user goes out from the center and then comes back to the center again. So these are two strokes that we have for every line, right? Um, and to get the final relative angle, we simply average out the relative angles that we obtain from these two strokes. So now the question is, how do we actually get these direction vectors from the finger motion data? So initially, uh, at the first step, we have the acceleration and orientation data um, from the ring. Um, now, the first uh, step after we have the raw data is to make the decoding independent of the orientation of the surface on which the pattern is present. So the surface could be horizontal, vertical. We don't want that to affect our decoding. Uh, secondly, we don't want f variations in finger orientation of the user to affect the decoding as well. And therefore, uh, we obtain the orientation independent acceleration um, in this step. Um, you can see the time series waveform for one of the acceleration axes on the right. Um, next, we obtain velocity from the acceleration and then calculate the magnitude of velocity. Uh, we then run a peak detection algorithm on this uh, velocity magnitude waveform uh, to detect the peaks in velocity. And these peaks essentially correspond to the different strokes uh, because the user is pausing momentarily between uh, the strokes as we saw in the video. 
So if you look at the last waveform, you can see we have nine pairs of peaks. So this includes line zero as well. So in total, nine, peak, uh, nine pairs of peaks. And once we have these peaks, we calculate the velocity direction vectors at these peaks. And then we use dot product to get the relative angles one to eight. And then we round them off to the closest multiple of 45 degrees. So uh, this was a very broad overview of uh, the decoding algorithm. Um, there are more details, uh, and you can find them in the paper. Uh, now, with asterisk, as we saw, the user has to pay attention to the number labels while scanning. And so we designed a second motion code scheme called Obelisk. And Obelisk is a self-guiding motion code where the user simply needs to follow uh, the path. So the user, again, starts at the red center and then simply traces along the path. And the encoding and decoding for this follows a design similar to asterisk, so I won't go into the details. So now that we have designed the system, there are multiple questions with respect to the performance of motion codes. So firstly, what is the accuracy of both asterisk and obelisk? Uh, does the decoding algorithm really result in orientation independence? Um, what are the accuracies for different base angles? Uh, basically, how low can the base angle be without compromising on accuracy? And finally, how does the length of the stroke uh, affect accuracy? Because the longer the length is, the more time it will take for the user to move through it. Uh, and so we want to minimize it uh, as much as possible. And to answer these questions, we conducted a user evaluation with four independent variables, the scheme, asterisk, or obelisk, the surface orientation, uh, so the surface on which the tag was placed uh, was mounted horizontally or vertically. Um, the stroke length, which was either 1.5 centimeters or 3 centimeters, and the base angle, 45 degrees, 36 degrees, or 30 degrees. So there were 24 conditions in total. Um, we, have, we had 12 participants, each of whom performed scanning for 10 random patterns for each of the 24 conditions. And the results, first of all, showed that the decoding for both motion schemes was independent of orientation. Uh, the horizontal and vertical orientations had very similar accuracies for both asterisk and obelisk across all the conditions. Um, the results also clearly showed that the accuracy for trials where the length was 1.5 centimeters was significantly lower than uh, for the three centimeter trials. And one of the primary reasons uh, for this was higher overshooting error. And again, uh, this is something that we talk about in the paper. Um, so I'll focus on just the three centimeter results. So these are the accuracies for asterisk and obelisk for the three base angles. Um, now, as you can see, the accuracy for asterisk 45 degrees is 95%. For 36 degrees, it is 93%. And for 30 degrees, it is 90%. The accuracy of obelisk, on the other hand, is uh, statistically significantly low at 88% for 45 degrees, and it is much lower for 36 and 30 degrees. Now, we applied error correction to the data um, uh, using extended Hamming codes, uh, which is uh, four steps uh, are used for data, four steps or four digits are used for data, and the other four are used for error correction. So in that case, the accuracy improves to these values that you see, uh, uh, which, uh, and some of the cases, uh, these are near 100%. Uh, but of course, doing error correction reduces the information capacity from the order of millions to tens of thousands. So uh, to summarize, uh, with error correction, asterisk 30 36 degrees provides an information capacity of uh, 10,000 possible sequences with a 98% accuracy and a 10 second scanning time. Also with error correction, obelisk 45 degrees uh, provides 12,000 sequences with a 96% accuracy and a seven second scanning time. So these results show that motion codes are not only feasible, but are immediately useful for usage uh, scenarios which require up to uh, 10,000 or 12,000 patterns. Also, even without error correction, asterisk 45 degrees provides close to uh, 17 million possible sequences with an accuracy of 
Uh, I'll now describe some extensions of uh, motion codes uh, that we did. Uh, so, so far we've talked about uh, finger motion on the surface. Uh, we also investigated in-air scanning of motion codes if you want to scan things on billboards. And the results were, again, encouraging and showed more than 95% uh, accuracy with error correction for both asterisk and obelisk. Um, now, another property of motion scanning is that they are more interactive than wireless or optical codes. And this can be utilized to build new kind of interactive passive tags. So, for example, if you're in a museum, uh, you can select the art piece and the language of the audio in one go using an interactive uh, motion code like this. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, one potential application for self-guiding motion codes could be for visually impaired users, and this is something that we are uh, exploring right now. And with that, I'll end. Uh, I'd just like to mention that I will soon be joining uh, Facebook Reality Labs, and uh, we are hiring. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, Akar. I, I have a few questions um, on this. I think this is really uh, an exciting interaction technique. I'll give you ch guys the chance to uh, walk up to the microphone if you have any questions. Yes, over there. Hi, uh, Paul Asenti at Adobe. Um, nice work. Uh, one thing I was wondering is if you noticed any de degradation of performance over time. Um, Cause this seemed like one of those odd cases where people might get worse over time rather than better because once they understand what they're doing, they're not going to be as careful about it. So I wondered if you noticed any of that effect. Yeah, that's an excellent observation. We actually did notice that in our pilot studies, which is why we had to introduce a lot of breaks during our actual study so that people don't get, get fatigued or, or people don't get overconfident and try and do it very quickly. But again, this is an issue which will not present itself in the real world because in the real world they are not going to do uh, 240 patterns in one hour as they did in our study, right? They would do it once in one hour or something. Um, but you're right, like over a period of time they may get overconfident and try to do it um, quickly. So that was one of the issues with the 1.5 centimeter um, codes because what the users were doing was that because they were trying to do it quickly, they would over, overshoot the uh, small line and which caused a lot of errors. And that was not happening with three centimeters so much. So I think the longer length is the solution to solve that um, problem. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we got another question. Go ahead. Um, hi, Jackie, Jackie Young from Stanford University. On top of that question, have you considered adding some filtering or machine learning to solve overshooting or um, basically improve accuracy? Um, so we did consider it um, not for, so, so we did consider classification instead of just signal processing right. to actually uh, figure out um, which uh, category, but we found out that it's not helping a lot we did not consider applying machine learning to solve overshooting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll have to think about that, but that's, that's a really, yeah, really nice idea. Cool, yeah. thanks. Thank you. All right, um, I think the one thing I, was, I would like to ask, and then we'll wrap this up, is um, we've, we haven't really heard about speed. I mean, you could do a larger trajectory with a lo higher speed and still be pretty quick about this. Um, have you looked at different speeds of interaction? If you do it very carefully, I'm sure it's more precise. If you do it faster, it's a little more sloppy, but you get more bits per second. Um, yeah, so yeah, so, so that's something that is very subjective to the user because we provide the user with a pattern, and then the user decides how to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so the speed... Were the, the analysis of speed was implicit in the sense that we found out that asterisk is taking a, a, lo, uh, a longer amount of time um, than obelisk, uh, to 10 seconds versus 7 seconds. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, the question of uh, exploring speed explicitly would be more relevant if we are looking at free form curves 
and not these lines which ha ask you to pause momentarily in between. Right, so these are, uh, because initially we were also trying to look at freeform curves, but then for those you need displacement information from the acceleration, which is uh, very difficult to derive because we were only using directional vectors and not really magnitude. Um, but yeah, uh, I think if you're working with freeform curves, uh, which is something that I think should be possible, um, then in that case, uh, the speed should be an explicit uh, thing to consider. Yeah. All right, thank you. So a uh, couple things. First of all, big hand of applause to these Wednesday morning presenters here and also to yourself for showing up. 